uh, last visiting speaker, Carlota Perez, is a visiting professor at the London School of Economics. She's also affiliated with the Tallinn University, where she's a technology and development professor and also an honorary professor at Sussex. She has a long background in public service and different levels, and we're very excited to greet her to the stage. This is Carlota Perez. Thank you very much. I, uh, it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here today to celebrate this 350th anniversary of your university. I'm very proud to be here. Well, I've been asked if the world is becoming a better place. And I'm suggesting that maybe a global, sustainable, golden age could be ahead. Sounds optimistic, doesn't it? But I sort of changed the question. Instead of, is it becoming a better place? I'm trying to say, can we make it a better place? I like it in that sense, because we can't just wait for the world to become a better place. And in order to do that, I'm going to share with you a view from the history of technological revolutions. That's my work, that's what I've been working on for the past several decades. And I have been able to uh, extract from this experience the optimism that I hope I can transmit to you today. So what I will argue today is that ICT makes the future digital and global. That's unavoidable. That's what the information technology is about. It has no borders, it crosses everything. So our future is digital and global. But we must also make it green, because otherwise we won't be able to have that future because we don't have seven planets. And the thing is that markets alone cannot do it. A clear policy direction is needed, and Europe could take the lead. I'm going to try to argue then to answer three questions. Why now? Is it really that we have it ahead? Why smart green growth, which is the direction that I think we could have? And why Europe? Now, because historical experience shows that we are precisely at the appropriate juncture for shaping the future. To be able to argue that, I'm going to start by, by identifying the five technological revolutions. We have had five in the last 240 years in the whole history of capitalism. So we begin with the Industrial Revolution at the end of the 18th century. Machines, factories, canals, the internet of the time. Then, from 1829, we have the second, which is the age of steam, coal, iron and railways. The third was the age of steel and heavy engineering. That was the first globalization. We had all the engineering works making the infrastructure of the world. And we had, of course, uh, steamships that allowed southern meat and wheat and minerals and everything to come to the north. So, we, so that was the first globalization. Then we come to a much better known time for us, which is the age of the automobile, oil, plastics and mass production, beginning in 1908 with Ford's Model T. And our current age of information technology and telecommunications from 1971 with Intel's microprocessor. Now you see that the arrow is only halfway. That's exactly what I'm going to tell you today. We're only halfway along this technological revolution, and what we have ahead could be precisely a golden age. Now, the thing is that each of these revolutions brings a techno-economic and socio-institutional shift. It's quite a major transformation, and I don't think any of us doubt it, because what we've been living through in the past 30 or 40 years is quite impressive in terms of change. Just think, the Internet only became something for us in 1994, 20 years ago. There are lots of people here uh, who were born after the Internet came. So we're talking about a very major change. 
And also, what happens is that each revolution brings new directions for innovation and a potential leap in productivity, not only in the revolutionary industries, in microelectronics and software and all the rest, but across the whole economy. So we have five, and that's enough to find the pattern. And in fact, if we look at the historical record, we see a regular pattern of propagation of each of these revolutions. What we have is, first of all, an installation period for the first 20 or 30 years. Now, that installation period is the time of creative destruction. That's when there are lots of losers and lots of winners. It's very tough times in terms of people, in terms of regions, in terms of industries. Those are the 20 or 30 years that we already have behind us on this revolution. Then there is a turning point, which I will talk about in a minute, and the deployment period, which is what I've called the Golden Age, because that I will call then, not like Schumpeter creative destruction, but that's a time of creative construction. It's when all industries, all activities, all innovation come together, and they then create the possibility of a better life for the many. So the sequence is eruption, bubble prosperity, recession, golden age prosperity, maturity, for each of them. So after canal mania of the first revolution, we have the Great British Leap, after the panic, after the bubble. After the collapse of railway mania, we have the Victorian boom. What follows the London-funded uh, global boom collapses which happened in Argentina, in, in New Zealand, in Australia, in the US, all over the Southern Hemisphere and in various other countries that were tied to the British Empire in one way or another, we have the Belle Epoque. The Belle Epoque in Europe, in the US, it was called the Progressive Era. Then the Roaring Twenties, the famous Roaring Twenties. After that, what came? Well, first of all, the 1930s and the war, but after that, the post-war boom, the golden age. How about now? We've had the dot-com boom in the 90s, we had the global casino in the 2000s, and since 2008, we are in this sort of turning point. The future could be a sustainable golden age. Installation is led by finance, that's what we've been seeing. We've had a financialized world in all these decades, since the 80s especially. And then we might have in front of us what I would consider a sustainable global golden age, because this is the second globalization. There is no way we're going to avoid that, although it doesn't mean that countries will not have their own national policies. But, but there is the, the fact that information technology knows no borders, so that makes a big difference. So the thing is that the first is led by finance, but the deployment period, the golden age, is led by production, by production capital, aided by the state. It's guided by the state. Each time this has been the case. This is what I'm writing a book about now. So we are here. We are in that gray moment. We are in this recession. We are like in the 1930s. So, what is the nature of this moment? What's the nature of the turning point? As in the 1930s and now, structural unemployment, de-skilling, hopelessness, inequality, casino finance, low investment, feeble growth, social unrest, populist messianic leaders being followed, xenophobia, economic migrations, talk of secular stagnation, recessions, even depression, does it sound familiar? It's happened before, and it's happening now. But the thing is that there is a huge underlying technological potential that lacks a clear synergistic direction. There is a technology waiting there to transform society if it is properly guided. So the direction for golden ages is actually defined by two features. One is an active state tilting the playing field in a particular direction that makes everything converge. And the other is the emergence of a new lifestyle. And this is very important because that's what creates 
the jobs. So the active state tilting the playing field, what does it do? It provides a clear path for profitable innovation because then you have the skills, the suppliers, everything because they go in the same direction. It also creates sufficient dynamic demand, that demand that is growing and that guarantees that you have enough demand for whatever innovation you're bringing to the market as long as you go along those paths. Then we have the reduction of inequality. Sometimes it's just for social peace. Other times, like in the post-war boom, it probably was because of the fear of communism, that threat. You know, there are all sorts of things. Maybe we could do it now because of the fear of environment or because of the fear of all these populist movements. Whatever moves politicians, the thing is, you need a reduction in inequality for social purposes, even though they might do it for whatever purposes they want. The emergence of a new lifestyle is a new aspirational good life. Some people who are trying to talk about green are making you feel guilty or the fear of this horror. Societies don't move that way. You move 10% of the population with that. You move all the population if you can bring the good life to aspire to, and if that good life is green. That's what I will argue in a minute. And the other thing, of course, is that once you change the lifestyle, then there is a whole range of jobs that will cater to it. This happened, of course, with suburbanization, which was the, you know, the home ownership, the, the all-electric home, created enormous opportunities for production, for jobs of all sorts. So these two things together determine the level of growth and job creation. And of course, we understand growth not necessarily just as quantitative, but something much more qualitative. So at the same time, then, we're talking about each golden age as being actually a lifestyle change. The process even of lifestyle change produces the golden age nature. So each one, first we have urban Victorian living from the 1850s in England, then the cosmopolitan Belle Epoque in Europe in the 1890s, from the 1890s, uh, then suburbia, suburban American way of life from the 1950s, copied all over the world. Could we have smart green living now? Each lifestyle change creates new job opportunities for innovation, investment and jobs. But the speed of change depends on the policy direction. The policy is what makes it possible for the changes that need to happen to happen fast enough to get the jobs, to get the well-being, to get uh, the, the better life. Which have been the directions before? Well, the first was just war procurement for the, for the Napoleonic Wars. So that's not very much about <laughs> very purposeful uh, good living, but that's what happened. Then in the second, it was about urbanization, the cities, the growth of cities, London. Basically, this was still in the UK. The first two revolutions were mainly UK and the beginning of them in Europe in the second. And Britain became the workshop of the world, sort of like China is doing now. Then in the third, we have maximum mobility of goods and people. That was the first globalization. So you had the steamships, the transcontinental railways, the transcontinental, transoceanic cables for telegraph. So everything was a question of being able to move. So you had trade all over the world. And that created the cosmopolitan also way of life, which we mentioned before, and a lot of investment. And the fourth, suburbanization plus the welfare state because of course if you didn't have the welfare state you couldn't pay for your house for your refrigerator for all the goods that you bought per month what what suburbanization and the welfare sta state did was to allow the majority of the workers the blue collar workers to own houses and have a middle income uh, a middle class income and a middle class sort of lifestyle so, and the Cold War, of course, was another one of the big directions for innovation and for investment. What could be the direction now? Well, 
have suggested smart green growth. Why? What type of direction would we need? What, what conditions would this direction have to have? First of all, it has to be one that takes advantage of the potential of ICT, of information technology, for productivity, global development, and intangibles. If you don't have high productivity in parts of the economy, you don't have enough wealth to fund the low productivity activities that have to do with lifestyles. But you know, a truck driver here and a truck driver in Bolivia earn very different salaries, even though they do the exact same job. And that has to do with the fact that you have to have high productivity activities in order to be able to afford the low productivity ones. Then it has to be one that opens innovation paths for all industries and activities, because that's what the direction is. You need convergence so that every industry, every activity can, get, uh, can have opportunities for innovation and for growth and for improvement and for creating jobs. It also has to be one that enables a good life for all within the boundaries of the planet. And when I say all, I mean global development and the boundaries of the planet. Well, you know that we have a lot of limits. It isn't just CO2. We have much more than that. And it also has to be one that's already a clear trend in business and social behavior. You can't take it out of a hat the rabbit out of a hat. The government now decides that we're going to have this direction. What you do is to accelerate and enable something that's already there and that fulfills all those other conditions. And that is why I think that it is smart green growth. Now, what exactly is it? Well, I can tell you one thing. It is not just about renewables. It is not just about low carbon. That's a very important part, but that's not it. In order for, me, for it to be really a lifestyle change, we have to go much further. So what it is, it's a constant increase in the proportion of intangibles in GDP and lifestyles. And intangibles are all sorts of things, from services to just pleasures. By shifting to services rather than products and multiplying the productivity of resources so you can do much more with less material, smaller things and more durable and so on. So it would be a question of accent on care, preventive health, exercise, creativity and experiences, drastic reduction of waste, an increase in reuse and recycling, making durable products truly durable, they should deserve the name, with rental and maintenance. Just think of maintenance. If, if every product, instead of having to buy it five times in a lifetime, the product's lifetime was enough for five human people to have the product, we would be able to have full global development and we would have enough materials and enough energy to do the whole thing. But we also would have an enormous number of maintenance workers because we would have to keep those things up to date, we'd have to, to um, uh, update them and so on. And of course, the flourishing of the social economy and so on. The social economy being the collaborative things, not necessarily Uber, but, but the ones that really mean that people work together and share things and uh, use butter and so on. It would include all industries and would make the most of ICT. And the other aspect that I said was important, it has to be something that you accelerate, something that's already there, something that you don't take out of a hat. It is already happening, and as always, it's at the top of the income scale, at the top of the education scale, and among the young. What's happening? <coughs> Pref preferring natural instead of synthetic, minimalist design, gourmet and organic food, small rather than big, working from home, active and creative prosumer, people who work, produce their own things uh, throughout on internet, and not just a passive consumer, couch potato watching TV. Exercise for well-being, cycling and extreme sports, solar power as luxurious as well as electric cars, intense internet use, anti-waste, pro-recycling, high quality versus quantity, customized versus standard, services versus tangible products. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so active policies need to make it the most profitable direction. This is already happening. We need everybody to enter that and include many other things. And why Europe? Well, Europe, in my view, is well placed to take the lead. 
It's high in science and engineering skills. Uh, it has quite an appreciation of the pre-industrial past, and that seems strange. Why would I say that that's important? Well, because the whole idea of having durable things, of having hand, uh, handmade things, of having, you know, all these values are already there in Europe. There are other countries that are more just the new, 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 new only, and it's much more difficult. Not impossible, but it's... The populations have ad adopted both ICT and sustainability values quite a bit, more than in other places, maybe California and Massachusetts, New York can also be, but basically, Many companies are innovating in green directions. In fact, the patent, the patent record of Europe is significantly higher than others in terms of this. Uh, there is a general recognition of the environmental limits. There aren't that many people saying that it's not true, that uh, climate change or this or that. It's much less, much less strong, that resistance. And especially Europe is not so deeply wedded to mass production or pure markets. Among other things, because we didn't have these huge expanses where you could have suburbanization going so far and everybody just using cars. I mean, the use of trains is uh, an absolutely normal thing in Europe and so on. You know, there are many reasons, many of those little details that come together into making less resistance to the change. So Europe can become the test bed for smart green innovation, attracting investment for that, and the Nordic countries can forge ahead. They, are, they already are doing so and showing the way. So branding Europe smart green. That made in Europe would mean healthy, safe, environmentally friendly, sustainable, reusable, recyclable, best tech, high or low, because low tech is also good, best value, advanced production standards, a sign of good living, and the same with engineering, education, and other services for development, because although I have not been able to say this in this limited time, uh, we need full global development. The advanced world would be able to specialize in engineering and uh, infrastructure and everything to help the developing world do their own thing, but with help from the higher technologies that can make it possible for them and also then to have trade between the two. So I've tried to argue that this is the right time to provide a different and viable model for global development, and that we must turn the environmental problem into the urgently required socio-economic solution for our day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlota Perez. Her latest book is called Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital, The Dynamics of Bubbles and Golden Ages. You may want to check that out if you want to touch some more on the subject that she was talking on in her address.